Uh, I'm Joe Lazama, the Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Internal Medicine, and thank you for joining us uh, for our second edition th of this uh, winter, uh, spring, summer, second semester, if you will, of the Roy Benke Grand Round Series. Uh, today, we have an outstanding young clinician giving our, our talk, uh, Dr. Jonathan Halal. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Halal, who is an assistant professor in the Division of, Gastro in the Division of Gastroenterology here at USF. Uh, he hailed originally from the Miami area where he spent his undergraduate and medical school years at the U, as they call it, at the University of Miami. After his eight years at Hurricane Land, uh, he went off to Houston and did his internal medicine residency at Baylor, uh, followed by a return to our Sunshine State, uh, engracing us in GI fellowship here uh, during the, the 2015 to 2018 years, then headed off to Milwaukee, uh, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to do his advanced endoscopy year before returning here to Tampa in 2019 to join our faculty. Uh, Dr. Halal has been very involved in teaching, as noted already by his growing CV of publications and poster presentations with GI Fellows and internal medicine residents, and already has been a recipient of the Patrick Brady GI Fellowship Teaching Award in a short time on the faculty. Uh, Jonathan today is going to talk about uh, the evaluation and management of pancreatic cysts and a very important topic, uh, and we look forward to his talk. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for giving us our, our grand rounds today. Uh, you can go ahead. All right, thank you, Dr. Lazama, for that wonderful introduction. Let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. Uh, can you all see the PowerPoint? Looks good. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Um, so as um, as mentioned, you know today's topic is going to be about the uh, evaluation and management of pancreatic cysts. This is something that uh, all of us encounter, whether it's just uh, uh, you know gastroenterologist or you know primary cares. Um, so the uh, learning objectives for today um, are the following. Uh, we're going to uh, learn to uh, identify the clinical characteristics of the different pancreatic cysts, uh, select the preferred surveillance strategy for different types of pancreatic cysts, uh, recognize the malignant potential uh, for pancreatic cysts, and also describe the indications for surgery uh, for such cysts. So little background here. So pancreatic cyst, the prevalence has been increasing significantly over the past several years, but it's the result of more and more, you know, cross-sectional abdominal imaging that's being done on patients. Um, you know, most patients who come to the emergency room would you know, oftentimes get imaging, whether it's an abdominal ultrasound or CAT scan, and, and these tend to pick it up. And the addition of more imaging plus the improved quality of said imaging has really increased the, the uptake on, on the prevalence of, of these cysts. Um, the prevalence is estimated to be roughly anywhere from 2.4 to 13.5 percent, uh, you know, in the asymptomatic populations, and it increases more and more with age. Um, now, the increase in incidence of pancreatic cysts is felt to be not because more people are developing more and more cysts, because the overall incidence of pancreatic cancer-related mortality has been the same. So it's felt to be related to just the uh, increased incidental findings on on, on imaging. Um, there's multiple different types of pancreatic cysts, which we're going to you know, touch upon today, and they have, you know, varying natural histories and malignant potentials. Um, you know, if you exclude pancreatic adenocarcinoma with cystic degeneration, then mucinous cysts present the predominant uh, premalignant lesions. And there's, uh, you know, uh, two main type. There's IPMENs or MCNs that IPMN stands for intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, and MCN is mucinous cystic neoplasm. Um, the available literature is contradictory in exactly how significant the risk is of these precancerous lesions and in, in turning into, into cancer. Overall, it's felt to be a low risk, but there is still some risk. Um, you know, but so due to their prevalence, the uncertain malignant potentials, you know, pancreatic cysts can be a, a significant angst for both, you know, the patient and the provider. And you'll also see is unfortunately our our uh, you know uh, society guidelines are not exactly crystal clear on on what to do, and there's some differences, but you know between those society guidelines, so they can be quite difficult and frustrating to to manage. Hence, why I wanted to discuss it today. Um, 
in addition to you know dealing with these cysts and sort of the angst and how you survey them you know pancreatic surgery isn't exactly benign you know there's a lot of risk associated with it there's a lot of more the mortality rate from pancreatic pancreatic resections is up to 2.1 percent and the morbidity rate uh, is about 30 percent um, that tends to be a result of if patients have to have a pancreatic duodenectomy or a whipple just because of how uh, long of a procedure it is and how intense it is and what kind of physical strain it puts in the body and not everyone's always able to recover from it. Um, large worrisome cysts are also found oftentimes in elderly patients who have comorbidities, again, making it harder for them to uh, recover from set surgeries. So, uh, you know, individual life expectancy and the risk of death from other factors must be carefully considered uh, in, in analyzing the risk of, pan of the pancreatic cyst pose. Um, now, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is what these premalignant cysts can turn into, is unfortunately, you know, a very uh, fatal disease. It's the fourth leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the, in the U.S. and has a dismal five-year survival rate, about 8%. Um, hence why, you know, since these cysts are precancerous lesions, the early diagnosis and management of them is essential, because if we find them, we can survey them, monitor them, and hopefully resect them sooner to help prevent the patient developing pancreatic cancer. And, um, uh, you know, because uh, unfortunately, there, we don't have a good screening tool for pancreatic cancer. Like, you know, for colonoscopy, I mean, for colorectal cancer, we have colonoscopies, right? And that can find, you know, precancerous polyps, you remove them, and that prevents them from developing colorectal cancer. Unfortunately, we haven't yet had a protocol in place to adequately screen for pancreatic cancer. You know, we haven't found a blood test. You know, I mean, obviously we have CAT scans and MRIs, but you can't just be CAT scanning and MRIing everyone. Just the cost benefit ratio is just not there yet. Um, and so, um, you know, we don't, we don't really have a good preventative management. So hence, when you have these cysts, surveying them, monitoring and managing them is, is essential to help prevent potential development of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So moving on, there's, you know, different types of pancreatic cysts. Uh, so these, there's two kind of general groups. There's the non-neoplastic group and then the neoplastic group. Um, the non-neoplastic group are the is your pancreatic pseudocysts. Uh, pancreatic pseudocysts develop, you know, after you've had a bout of acute pancreatitis from the inflammation of it, you'll get disruption in the pancreatic duct. Uh, that leads to uh, release of pancreatic juices and you know, amylase lipase into a into a collection um, or you know in in or around the pancreas. Um, and uh, again, that's, that, that does not have any malignant potential. There's also just regular simple cysts where people just found to have them that, again, do not have any pre, uh, you know, malignant potential. Then the um, neoplastic cells, there's, uh, they break them down a little bit further. There's the non-mucin producing, that's serous cyst adenomas. Um, and I'm going to touch upon each one of these cysts later on in further slides. There's the mucin producing ones, uh, and that's the two we previously just mentioned, that's the IPMNs, or introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, um, and the mucinous cystic neoplasm, or MCN. The IPMNs, they break them down into two subtypes. There's main duct IPMN involving the main pancreatic duct, and there's side branch or branch duct IPMNs, which avoid a, a side branch of the, of, of the pancreatic duct. Uh, further neoplastic cysts, there's solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, which is a rare tumor that can present in very young patients. Uh, and then obviously pancreatic adenocarcinoma, uh, if it sometimes advances enough, it can have cystic degeneration and it, you know, it appears as a pancreatic cyst when in fact it's actually a solid tumor with, with, with cystic degeneration. Um, so now kind of going back to pancreatic pseudocyst, as I mentioned previously, so, you know, they occur in patients who have a history of acute or chronic pancreatitis. These do not have a malignant potential. Um, one thing that you have to always keep into mind is if somebody presents with a you know new presentation of acute pancreatitis has a pancreatic uh, you know cyst or you know which is felt to be a pancreatic cystis if there's no discernible cause for pancreatitis you know the mo most common things being biliary pancreatitis or alcohol induced pancreatitis you know triglycerides medications etc if there's no obvious cause sometimes uh, you know a you know, pancreatic cyst can be the cause for pancreatitis, can be the sort of the presenting uh, symptom for it. And it's very rare. It's not common at all, but just something to keep in the back of your mind if somebody comes in with acute pancreatitis pseudocyst and you don't really know um, the uh, the cause. Um, now, along with the history and the imaging findings, EUS with, uh, you know, fine needle aspiration, EUS is endoscopic ultrasound with fine needle aspiration of the cyst fluid can be helped to help 
can be performed to help differentiate what, what the cyst is and in the, and the, and the sense that the aspirate does. And the aspirate for pancreatic pseudocyst will oftentimes be like this brown sort of muddy color. It can be high in lipase and amylase because, again, the pancreatic pseudocysts are connected to the pancreatic ducts since it was a duct disruption leading to the pseudocyst. And they'll have a low uh, carcinoembryonic embry antigen, or CEA. Now, um, serous cyst adenomas, and now I'm, I'm finishing off with the non-neoplastic cyst, moving to the neoplastic cyst. Serous cyst adenoma, honestly, it's kind of debatable why it's even in the neoplastic cyst because the neoplastic risk is very low, but none, nonetheless, they're classified as that. They're most common in women, about 75%. They happen uh, greater than 50 years old. Um, now, again, very low risk of malignancy. There's been a recent study um, done back in 2016 in gut that looked at uh, 2,500 serous cyst adenomas and found the risk of actually developing in the serous cyst adenocarcinoma was 0.1%. So it's very rare for these to turn into cancer, and that's what's affected the subsequent guidelines that we'll talk later. Um, the majority of these patients who, ha who have these are asymptomatic. They're found incidentally, again, on imaging done for some other reason. Uh, classic imaging characteristics, you'll have this microcystic or honeycombed appearance. Uh, uh, you also can have a central scar. If you look at the image here in the top right, you, you'll see the, the central scar there. On the endoscopic ultrasound images, you'll see this sort of microcystic or honeycombed appearance of it. Um, if you do an endoscopic ultrasound and find your aspiration, the cyst fluid analysis is going to show the CEA level to be low, again, because it's not a mucin-producing um, cyst, and it will show that the amylase is low because it's not connected to the pancreatic duct. To be honest, serous cyst adenomas oftentimes are, are, are diagnosed just off imaging alone. If you have a good quality MRI and RCP uh, with contrast, that, that oftentimes can delineate it pretty well and show the classic findings. So you don't necessarily have to do an endoscopic ultrasound with finding final aspiration to diagnose it. And, and that being said, the, the final aspirations of serous cyst adenomas oftentimes are non-diagnostic and don't always give you an answer. Uh, and, and oftentimes they're bloody aspirates just because these... these um, you know, cysts tend to have a lot of vascularity to them, and so it's hard to get a good sample of, of fluid. Um, if now rarely do, uh, now, if someone does have a serious cyst adenoma, again, typically the person's there's no more, there's no further surveillance needed. Um, you know, because the the cancer risk is very low. But in some sometimes some people can have can be symptomatic if they're very large cyst uh, serious cyst adenomas. I've seen one case in my you know, early, I guess my early short career, uh, one woman had almost a seven centimeter serous cyst adenoma that happened to be in the, in the, in the head of her pancreas. And it just kept kind of intermittently pinching off her pancreatic duct and causing some pancreatitis. And, and so she eventually had surgery for it and did well and fine. There was no malignancy on, on the surgical specimen. Uh, but again, it's very rare for someone to have surgery for this. The next category of, of uh, the neoplastic cyst, um, and, this is, and this is part of the mucin-producing cyst, is the, is, and this is the most common one, is the uh, IPMN, or intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm. Um, there's two main subtypes. Um, there's a side branch or, or, um, or branch duct IPMN. Uh, these are the most common. Overall risk of malignancy is very low on the, on the scale of one or two percentage points. Uh, there's main duct IPMN, um, overall much less common uh, to find this, but it does carry a very high risk of malignancy. Anywhere from almost 40 to 70 percent of main duct IPMNs have high-grade dysplasia or pancreatic cancer in the resected specimens. Um, one of the classic things you'll see uh, is a patchless mucin extruding papilla. You'll see it here in uh, this bottom right image. This is the major papilla, and it's just this, you know, mucin's coming out of it. It's very wide open and gaping. You actually here happen to happen to see the minor papilla showing the same thing. This is not something that you commonly see, but when you do, it's very cool. Um, now, on the CAT scan up here, you can see this markedly dilated main pancreatic duct within the pancreas as well, uh, consistent with an IPMN. There uh, are uh, mixed uh, mixed types of IPMN where you have a mixture of a main duct and side branch IPMN. Um, as I mentioned earlier, rarely IPMNs can be a cause for pancreatitis. Um, cyst fluid analysis, um, you know, again, you do an endoscopic ultrasound with final aspiration, the CEA level in this will be high because it's a mucin producing cyst, and the amylase will also be high because it's connected to the pancreatic duct. Um, 
here's an image here of um, some uh, MRCPs that show basically different types of, uh, of uh, IPMN. So image A uh, is showing a, si a small side branch IPMN that connects the main pancreatic duct here. Uh, image B is shows multifocal uh, small IPMNs. You can see all of them here, and the, there's the main pancreatic duct uh, traversing here. Uh, this is a little bit of a larger side branch IPMN, but again, it's not involving the main pancreatic duct, so they're side branch IPMNs. Image C is um, a large main duct IPMN. You can see this diffusely dilated um, main, main pancreatic duct. And um, D is also, uh, again, a, um, a large one. Or, or sorry, forgive me. C is one of the mixed types where you have a large main pancreatic duct and you also have dilated side branch IPMNs. And D is just a full a full on main pancreatic uh, main duct IPMN and it's very large. And these are the ones that harbor that high cancer uh, potential. Um, so further sort of pictures to show, again, uh, this, this is an example of the main duct IPMN on images, on this image A, a again, this mucin, patchless mucin produ producing uh, papilla. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound, this is using a radial probe, which gives you cross-sectional images, shows this very dilated main pancreatic duct. Um, this is an ERCP being done, and you can see here, this is a picture taken during an ERCP. There's a guy wire that's the cannulation has already been performed at the pancreatic duct and a and a, and a guy wire has been placed within the pa main pancreatic duct to allow access for interventions. And so uh, that's here in image A and then in image C, they're actually doing what's called pancreatoscopy, uh, where you actually pass like a, a like basically a baby scope. It's a smaller scope that has a uh, a camera and 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 the light and a working channel at the tip where you can directly visualize within the pancreatic duct. And here they're they're doing a pancreatoscopy to further evaluate. This is not something we do very commonly, but it can be done if you're worried about you know malignancy. You want to get specific biopsies of a certain area, or say there's large pancreatic duct stones that you want to remove and use um, electrohydraulic lithotripsy to break it up. Yeah, image D is an example of a pancreatoscopy image. Uh, this is a little bit of an older image with an older system. But there's a little bit better quality nowadays. Um, Image F is is a surgical pathology specimen of a, a resected pancreas with a main duct IPMN. Um, image eight, sorry, image H um, is an example of a side branch IPMN. You can see the main. This is on the endoscopic ultrasound. This is the main pancreatic duct. This anechoic lesion that's traversing through the neck of the pancreas, and here you can see this small side branch IPMN which connects to the main pancreatic duct. Uh, moving on to the next group of uh, the mucin producing neoplastic uh, cyst is the uh, MCN or mucinous cystic neoplasm. So the characteristics for this, it occurs most exclusively in women in the fifth to seventh decade of life, uh, most commonly located in the body or the tail of the pancreas. Uh, there's no communication of the pancreatic duct. Um, the, 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 and the Pathology will show this columnar epithelium surrounded by ovarian, you know, it's type stroma. Um, on imaging, you'll see on uh, cross sectional imaging, you can see wall calcifications. On endoscopic ultrasound, oftentimes you see a unilocular cyst like this, anechoic cyst. Sometimes you can have septations within it, little thin walls. Sometimes there's no septations at all here, as seen in image D. Uh, this is image B is an example of a surgical specimen showing the, the MCN and what it looks like after it's been resected. Um, if you do an endoscopic ultrasound with fine needle aspiration, in here the CEA level will be high because it's a mucin producing cyst, but the amylase will be low because again there's no connection to the pancreatic duct. That's kind of how you differentiate between an MCN and an IPMN is they both will have high CEA levels, but the MCN will have a low amylase lipase because there's no connection to the pancreatic duct. Um, these, you know, these do have a potential development to pancreatic cancer, but the risk is lower than it was previously thought. There's been some recent studies, um, two of them that have looked back and basically the risk of cancer is not thought to be as high as it previously was. Um, the one review looked at 90 resected specimens and found 10% of them had high grade dysplasia of pancreatic cancer. Uh, another looked at 344 MCNs um, and then there was no cases of high grade dysplasia of pancreatic cancer in less than three centimeter specimens with a normal CA-99 and no concerning features. So, because, you know, the thought has been over the years that if you find one of these, they get surgery no matter what. Now, that being said, because pancreatic cancer, you know, is so aggressive, 
I still would recommend surgery anyways. If somebody has one of these, you don't want to sit and wait on one of these. And then in four or five years, all of a sudden it's metastatic pancreatic cancer and you could have, you could have done something about it earlier. So uh, despite what those liter that literature shows, I still recommend surgery for these people, assuming they're good surgical candidates. Um, the next type of neoplastic cyst, this is not a mucin producing cyst. This is a very rare type of lesion. Um, this is a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm. It happens in a 10 to 1 ratio of women to men. Most, uh, it tends to happen uh, pretty young, actually, in people in their 20s. It can occur in any part of the pancreas. It has this mixed sort of solid cystic components to it. Uh, you can see that on uh, both the, the surgical specimen as well as um, endosonography with these sort of anechoic areas, which are cysts, and then the solid components around it, which are more hyperechoic or hypoechoic. Um, patients with this can present with abdominal pain, but oftentimes it can be asymptomatic. The cyst analysis, when you do an endoscopic ultrasound with final aspiration, uh, will show a low amylase because, again, there's no connection to the pancreatic duct, a low CEA because they're not mucin producing, and oftentimes they're bloody. Um, this, this, the cytology was what will be helpful in diagnosing the tumor um, that will give you the answer, which is also collected during a fine needle aspiration or, or, or biopsy. Uh, if someone's found to have these and you have resected, the survival rate's great. At five years, is 98%, so that's good news. Um, so this table here sort of summarizes everything we've discussed about the different types of cysts. Um, you know, we've, uh, we have the non-neoplastic type, which we talked about the pseudocysts. These are due to acute or chronic pancreatitis. Uh, you know, when you aspirate the fluid, oftentimes can be brown, you know, high amylase lipase level and a low CEA level, because again, it's not mucin producing. Uh, these are benign and don't have to have any sort of uh, surgery or operation for it. Nowadays, most pseudocysts are managed endoscopically. Um, you know, it's not something I'm touching upon in this in this talk, but you know, we can do uh, endoscopic ultrasound guided cyst gastrostomies. Basically, we we take an endoscopic ultrasound probe we, and through the stomach we can find the cyst, and we can actually using cautery assistance, um, you know, basically advance a stent through the stomach wall into the cyst cavity and deploy it, where it drains the pseudocyst into the into the gastrointestinal lumen to help treat it. Um, Sometimes we also manage it with an ERCP if someone has a pancreatic duct stricture, which was the cause for the, you know, say they have chronic pancreatitis and they have a stricture that led to the pseudocyst, the pancreatitis in the pseudocyst, you do an ERCP and through the major papilla, you can dilate and open up that stricture and place a plastic, you know, stent into the pancreatic duct to drain it transpapillary, basically through the pancreatic duct and out of the major papilla. Um, so those don't, those don't have to have surgery. Um, now, the neoplastic uh, type of cyst that we talked about, we talked about the serous cyst adenoma. This has an overall low risk of malignancy, it happens predominantly in women, 75%, happens in the sixth decade of life. The classic imaging findings are this microcystic honeycombed appearance. The aspirate, again, is low in CEA and low in amylase and lipase because it's not mucin producing and it doesn't connect to the pancreatic duct. The next uh, neoplastic ones are the mucin producing, so we have the IPMNs. Area they happen equivalently in men and women. They happen in the seventh decade of life. They're mucin producing. An EUS FNA of this will show a high CEA level as a result, and has a high amylase level because they're connected to the pancreatic duct. And there's two subtypes of IPMNs. There's the main duct, the one that's much less, much less common, but the higher risk of, of cancer, uh, where you have that you know uh, patchless orifice uh, to the major papilla with mucin coming out. And then there's the side branch, which is the most common type of precancerous cystic lesion, um, which has an overall low risk of cancer pro uh, progression. Um, and because it connects to the main pancreatic duct, has a high amylase. And also, since it's mucin producing, has a high CEA. Whoops, sorry. Um, now, there's a mixed type, which we discussed as well, which can be a mixed main and, and side branch. MCNs we discussed uh, occur exclusively in, in the ex exclusively in women in the fifth to seventh decade. Um, the vast majority um, are found in the body and tail, unilocular, sometimes have septations, sometimes don't. They're mucin producing, therefore, uh, the aspirate shows a high CEA level. Uh, they should not have an elevated amylase. Now, we talked about the rare uh, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, more, com very, uh, more common in women to men, happen at a young age in, in the 20s, um, have a good survival, um, you know, if, they, if it's resected. 
Um, and one type of leech I didn't quite talk about today is the cystic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, you know, those are usually non-functioning. They can be associated with MEN1. Um, they happen in the same instance in men and women in the fifth and sixth decade of life. And the diagnosis for this is the is the um, the cytology from the um, fine needle aspiration or biopsy will show that it's a neuroendocrine tumor. And it'll, it'll have a low CEA and a low amylase lipase because, again, it's not mucin producing. It's not connected to the pancreatic duct. Those are overall also rare, but as I mentioned, can be associated with some of these genetic conditions like MEN1. So um, after going through all those different types of cysts, now we come down to, you know, sort of what is the management that we do for these cysts? So what happens when you discover a cyst? Say somebody came in, they're complaining of uh, abdominal pain, you happen to get a CAT scan and you find one of these cysts. Uh, the abdominal pain, let's say it's from something else more than likely, but you find one of these cysts and you want to know what to do with it. So, so you, you know, you go back, you look at the history. Uh, if they have a history of acute pancreatitis or it's happening during the episode of acute pancreatitis, it's likely a, a pancreatic pseudocyst or if it's severe, you know, necrotizing pancreatitis, it could be a walled off necrosis. Um, so uh, once you, after the histories are very important to help you determine if it's a neoplastic versus non-neoplastic. Um, then you want to get a good dedicated imaging. Um, so you can get either a CT with a pancreas protocol that has, you know, thin slices in the area of the pancreas, or you can get an MRI, the pancreas, um, uh, with contrast and also with an MRCP. Um, both are uh, equivalent and, 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 are, and work well. There's been multiple studies comparing CTs and MRIs to see which is better, and the results show that they're basically comparable. Um, they have different features that make them beneficial. So MRI is better than CT in depicting internal morphology of the cyst, uh, you know, showing the connection to the main pancreatic duct, but it has lower spatial resolution and it's insensitive for identifying calcifications. Um, also, MRIs are affected by motion artifacts, and patients oftentimes have a hard time laying flat for a long period of time for the MRIs. So this um, slide is uh, kind of goes over a lot, and, and we're going to touch by it one by one. This comes from the American College of Gastroenterology's most recent guidelines on pancreatic cysts and their management. And um, I'm just going to sort of start at the top and work our way down. So as I mentioned, you find a cyst on imaging. So we had just mentioned in the last slide, is there a history of pancreatitis? If there is a history of pancreatitis, then it's likely a pseudocyst, and then you manage it accordingly for the pseudocyst. Um, the only th only other caveat is if you don't have any obvious culprit for pancreatitis and you have the cyst, is it potentially a cystic neoplasm causing acute pancreatitis? That's one thing you have to keep in the back of your mind. Oftentimes you'll have to get interval surveillance imaging down the road and let's say a month or so down the road to follow up and see if there's resolution of the pseudocyst and the pancreatitis to make sure that there wasn't an underlying cystic neoplasm going on there. Um, now going back to the top, now if the imaging shows this is um, uh, classic findings of a serous cyst adenoma, those you don't do any further surveillance for. You don't have to have an endoscopic ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, imaging can be diagnosed, diagnostic, and you don't have any more follow-up needed. Now, the next few things are going to ask about are trying to look at high risk, you know, characteristics of cysts that, you know, put you at risk for developing, you know, pancreatic cancer and the ones that you think you need to have surgical intervention for. Uh, and these will also be touched upon on, on late, later slides. But some of the things is, if you have the cyst, is there obstructive jaundice associated with the cyst? Is there, is there an associated solid mass associated with the cyst? If that's the case, then you should talk to, in a multidisciplinary group with surgical oncologists and advanced uh, gastroenterologist and help determine the next course of action, whether it's just going straight for surgery. Do you need an endoscopic ultrasound with final aspiration to kind of prove the diagnosis? Um, you know, there's been a big push, you know, uh, for neoadjuvant, you know, chemo and radiation in patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, so sometimes the surgical oncologist and medical oncologist radi and radiation oncologists need that information to, um, to help them uh, in, in, in uh, guide their treatment. Um, now, then if you don't have those things going on, then you want to look at some more sort of worrisome features. So is the main duct greater than five millimeters? This is a point of contention between a lot of the international societies on what size of main pancreatic duct is worrisome and not. Um, there's general consensus that greater than 10 millimeters of a pancreatic duct size is worrisome, but the 5 to 10 is sort of this gray zone. Uh, this society guidelines uses 5 millimeters as that as that cutoff. Is a cyst greater than 3 centimeters? That's considered you know, pretty universal to be a high-risk size to be worried about. 
And is there a change in the main duct caliber of, with upstream atrophy? If those features are present, then you'd want to get an endoscopic ultrasound, fine needle aspiration, uh, do cyst fluid analysis, test for cytology to see if there is potentially cancer harboring in there. Um, and if there is, that person should, should get a surgery. Um, you know, and things that are seen in endoscopic ultrasound or, you know, in our main duct involvement, patchless ampulla, if the cytology shows high-grade dysplasia or pancreatic cancer, or if there's a mural nodule, which is basically, a, you know, either cancer within the cyst or it's a precancerous lesion within the cyst. Um, so, again, if they have these, you talk about a multidisciplinary group, you talk about surgery, uh, and, you know, this guideline is the, from the American College of Gastroenterology is uh, a little more vague in what you know, management, they tell you to do the Japanese guidelines, which I'll touch later. Those are more definitive in saying you should do surgery. Uh, I think this is mostly to sort of protect maybe our surgeons and, you know, and so that they don't have to commit to surgery for if the patients are not a good surgical candidate or, you know, if they think they need neoadjuvant chemo and radiation first. So uh, I think that's maybe why there's a little bit of a change in, in the guidelines and not being so definitive in saying this person should 100% have surgery. Um, now, if none of these high risk features are present, you know, then it, it all the surveillance strategy is basically all based upon the size of the cyst. Um, and basically, the smaller the cyst, the lower the risk of developing into, into pancreatic cancer. So if, it's a, if the cyst is less than a centimeter, they recommend an MRI follow up in two years. If it's anywhere from one to two centimeters, you do an MRI in one year. If it's two to three centimeters, then you should go ahead and do an EUS FNA to help discern cl clearly if it's a mucinous cyst or not, uh, or just like a simple cyst or pancreatic pseudocyst. And then once that's confirmed, you kind of go into the whole uh, surveillance uh, strategy and you can do an uh, MRI in EU or EUS in six to 12 months. Uh, or, you, uh, or you can start, if the cyst gets above three centimeters, that's when you start talking about you know, surgery. If the FNA shows the serous cyst adenoma, then you don't do uh, any further surveillance. Um, so this table sort of, again, summarizes some of the high-risk characteristics of mucinous, you know, pancreatic cysts. So obstructive jaundice is one thing that's a big deal. Um, acute pancreatitis, if it's solely due to the cyst, is something you, you have to be worried about. If the if you have a markedly elevated CA199 level with no other benign cause to explain it, uh, imaging findings would be a mural nodule or solid component of the cyst. Um, a main pancreatic duct greater than five millimeters. This is according to the American College or gastro uh, guidelines. Again, that's a little bit of a topic of debate. Some people think 10 millimeters is what you have to worry about, not necessarily five. If there's a change in the main duct caliber with upstream atrophy, if the size of the cyst is greater than three centimeters, or if there's an increase in the cyst size of greater than three millimeters per year. And then obviously if the cytology, you know, from the aspirate shows high grade dysplasia or pancreatic cancer, that's obviously a high risk feature. Now, um, this slide touches upon, um, you know, the surveillance after you have the cyst, you know, uh, what do you do over time? You know, after you have that initial MRI done, uh, you know, so when the cyst is small, they say MRIs every two years for over four years, uh, you know, that's less than a centimeter. If they're one to two, you do an MRI yearly for three years. If they're two to three centimeters, none of this I expect anybody to remember. Uh, I mean, it's just stuff even that I come back and look at because, I mean, one, these guidelines are constantly changing. And then two, it's to put this stuff to memorization is kind of silly. So I just always have these guidelines kind of close nearby on hand so I can remember the kind of intervals that are recommended by the society guidelines. But the the general thing that this guy, these guy, this slide is trying to point out is that, you know, over time, if the cysts remain stable over time and they're small, you can eventually sp spread out their interval imaging. Um, you know, now if the cyst, uh, and basically if the cysts change over time or increase in size or something worrisome is present, whether it's the uh, pancreatic duct or, the, or, or um, you know, mural nodule present, that's when you have to reassess and, you know, do another endoscopic ultrasound, refer to the, the pancreatic surgeons for surgery uh, and whatnot. Um, this is just looking at to show you like sort of the difference between the Japanese and the American guidelines. This is the Japanese guidelines, the Fukuoka um, guidelines. Um, this is published back in 2017. But so they they break it down. I, I think their guidelines are a little bit easier to interpret than the, than the American College Gastro guidelines. At least a little bit simpler put together. But uh, the high risk stigmata to worry about is the obstruct is there obstructive jaundice as we mentioned, a mural nodule 
or is the pancreatic duct greater than 10 millimeters? If that's present, they say consider surgery. Um, are any of the worrisome, if, if none of those high-risk stigmata are present, or is there a worrisome feature? So, you know, pancreatitis thought to be due to the cyst, the cyst greater than three centimeters, a mural nodule, but less than five millimeters, thickened or enhanced cyst walls, main duct size five to nine millimeters, abrupt change in the caliber of the pancreatic duct with distal pancreatic atrophy, lymphadenopathy, elevated C19 line, C99 level, or a cyst growth rate greater than five millimeters over two years. So if any of these worrisome features are present, then they recommend endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, and to look for, you know, the things that are worrisome. So the mural nodule greater than five millimeters, main duct uh, involvement, cytology that's positive for either high grade dysplasia or malignancy. And again, if you have those, then you go to surgery. Uh, now, if you don't have any of these high risk or worrisome features, then again, it's based off the size. Uh, and they have just a little bit different intervals here in the Japanese guidelines on how often you do either a CT pancreas protocol, MRI. Um, again, and all the guidelines are kind of consistent in that the sense that they do aggressive surveillance initially on for a couple of years. And then if it looks stable over time, then you um, sort of spread out your intervals. Um, this article actually looked at trying to compare all the different guidelines and their different uh, factors and to see, you know, um, which societies think what's important and what's not important. It's just kind of interesting because you have there's European guidelines out there. There's the uh, American College of Gastro guidelines. There's two different types of American guidelines, American College of Gastro, American uh, Gastroenterological Association guidelines or AGA. And there's the Japanese guidelines, the International Association of Pancreatology. And then there's the radiology guidelines, the American College of Radiology. So obstructive jaundice across the board for them is considered, you know, high risk. Pancreatitis is considered high risk a relative, uh, you know, uh, indication, uh, you know, by the European guidelines, it's high risk for the American guidelines. Um, and it's a worrisome feature for the Japanese guidelines. Again, confusion because they're not sort of consistent. Um, I touched upon the main pancreatic duct guidelines. The European guidelines think it's a big deal when the pan pancreatic duct is greater than 10 millimeters. Uh, Japanese greater than 10 millimeters, American College of Radiology greater than 10 millimeters. It's only the American College of Gastro that said greater than five millimeters is considered to be worrisome. Um, so again, they, they touch about the, the mass, the mural nodules, cyst size, you know, so it just, just mo the slides are more, mostly interesting in the sense that it's showing that um, all the different societies have slightly different guidelines and recommendations. And it's a bit frustrating, <laughs> to be honest, from a, ga a gastroenterologist standpoint, because you kind of wish there'd be some consistency. Um, I, I think most people feel the Japanese guidelines, as well as the American College of Gastro guidelines, are they're probably the most comprehensive and the best to use. And that's the two that I, I honestly would, would use. Now, the question comes on comes down to how long do you continue surveillance? This is a big topic of debate, uh, you know, in general in, in medicine. Uh, so only one guideline recommends cessation of surveillance, and that's the AGA's guidelines. They say uh, you should stop after five years if there's no high risk features or in the size of the cyst is stable. Um, that's not in agreement with the other guidelines. They don't agree with that. They basically recommend continuing surveillance as long as the patient is a good surgical candidate and the patient wants to continue surveillance. Uh, because most of the studies of pancreatic cancer show, you know, that it takes anywhere from 15 to 20 years for, for a pancreatic cyst to turn into cancer. So if you stop after five years, then down the road, 15, 20 years, you will, you know, you'll be, you'll miss the, the, the window opportunity you had to intervene before it turned into cancer. Um, so again, it's an individualized approach uh, for the patients. Now, you know, say if somebody is, you know, 80 years old plus and has advanced congestive heart failure, COPD, and would never be a surgical candidate, then that per, that's somebody that you shouldn't keep surveillance on. But if there's somebody who's 50, you know, it has it incidentally and is in general good health, then you want to keep surveying them as, uh, as long as possible. Um, this slide here touches upon uh, some articles that have, um, some, uh, have looked at compare, comparing all these different society guidelines and pancreatic cysts and seeing kind of how they perform. Uh, and there's been several of them, um, some that compare only a couple societies, some that compare multiple, multiple societies. Um, basically, the um, 
you know, the AGA guidelines are like the least strict. So they, um, you know, so they, the thought behind them is that they would miss potentially other, you know, early cancers uh, that could have been intervened on. The American College of Gastro and the and the Japanese uh, Fukuoka guidelines are probably the the um, the most strict ones, and they can they find they perhaps find they they perhaps survey these low risk lesions a little bit more aggressively than the AGA guidelines. So some people argue that are we wasting too much healthcare dollars doing that? But fortunately, there's not really a good answer to that question. But you know the thing is, pancreatic. You know, cancer is such an aggressive malignancy with such a poor five-year survival. You know, whatever we can do to help find that smaller, small percentage of patients who will advance the cancer and prevent them from developing cancer is very helpful. Um, some new endeavors that are being, um, you know, uh, researched at with the pancreatic system or management is looking at different tumor biomarkers. Lately, there's been some look at looking at um, uh, intracystic glucose levels to see if they help determine, um, you know, uh, what uh, the risk of these cystic lesions turning into malignancy or not. Um, there's been some uh, research into there's been a lot of research actually into confocal laser endomicroscopy. Um, the thing how this works basically is you do an endoscopic ultrasound uh, where, where you do a fine you, you uh, do a final aspiration of the cyst, and then after you have the needle within the cyst, you advance this uh, confocal laser endomicroscope through the uh, the, the uh, working channel of the um, of the needle. And uh, you can look directly into the cyst and and evaluate it to see if it has a, a to determine what kind of cyst it is, if it's a mucin producing precancer cyst or not, and then also if it has any, you know, potentially high grade dysplasia or cancer to it. That is that has not quite come to fruition and been used universally because it requires a there's a high steep learning curve for gastroenterologists. Basically, you have to learn endomicroscopy and understanding how to read it, which most gastroenterologists don't know how to do. Um, you know, and so it's uh, but it's an interesting concept, but I don't know how universally applicable it's going to be. The Microsoft microbiopsy forceps have been uh, have been investigated and that's basically where a biopsy forceps gets passed through the, the needle channel once you're in the cyst you pass the, the small forceps through it and then you try to take a, a bigger bite or or biopsy of the cyst wall to help again diagnose it and look for cancer as well and uh, some studies have shown this is somewhat promising but also some studies have shown it you can have bad hemorrhage after this into the cyst you can have bad pancreatitis afterwards so it's again not quite fine-tuned um, there's also also the idea of endoscopic management of cysts has been coming around uh, as a way to help you know prevent the need for surgery. Um, you know there's been cyst ablation techniques, so you can use ethanol. There's paclitaxel, uh, rate of frequency ablation. Um, but again, these stuff is this stuff is still in in uh, you know uh, being researched in, in the works, and none of this stuff has been fleshed out of whether it's of how effective it is, how safe it is, and that sort of stuff. There's been some reports of horrible pancreatitis episodes related to doing this stuff. So um, take home points basically for today. Um, you know, so pancreatic cyst, you know, the prevalence is increasing because of the use of more abdominal imaging and improved quality of said imaging. Um, mucinous cysts present the predominant premalignant lesions uh, that are seen. Um, the branch, uh, the side branch or branch duct IPMN is the most common. Uh, again, these have a low malignant risk to them. Uh, you always want to get a good history and obtain good cross-sectional imaging when someone has a pancreatic cyst to help determine the type that they have. So you want to either get that CT pancreas or the MRI abdomen with contrast and MRCP. Um, in general, so the high risk uh, features of for malignancy of cysts that you want to look out for and you want to consider surgery referral are obstructive jaundice. Uh, acute pancreatitis due to the cyst, a size greater than three centimeters, a main pancreatic duct greater than 10 millimeters, uh, and the presence of a mural nodule sli uh, or solid component to it. Um, and you want to continue surveillance of the pancreatic cyst per the available guidelines that are out there. I would recommend using the American College of Gastroenterology guidelines or the uh, International Association of Pancreatology or the Japanese guidelines. And you do those only in patients who remain to be surgical candidates. Again, that's another thing that I can't stress enough as um, you know, if someone is very elderly or very ill and sick, and there's not someone who you ever think would tolerate a Whipple or a pancreatectomy, 
of some type, then there's no point in surveying them. This, uh, you know, and so it just needs to have this. You just need to have a discussion with the patient and describe and you know tell them about this and and not continuing surveillance is completely reasonable. All right, and that's the end of my talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? I appreciate Dr. Lau. Excellent talk. Uh, appreciate the way you organized and presented those. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, probably one of the best pancreatic cyst lectures, and I, I usually go to everything pancreas that's offered at American College of Physicians because it's such an important topic. And uh, as you highlighted, some of the pitfalls that can folks can get into in managing. I think you did a spectacular job. Let's see what questions we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Lozano. Dr. Halal, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hey, Jeff Gill. So can you comment anything on um, anything new about FNA for you mentioned CEA is so important to distinguish between a mu mucinous cystic neoplasm versus a serous one, which is what determines whether it's precancerous, essentially. Can you comment on the, the newer thing that um, people are doing, which is the, I think it's a low glucose. Really yeah. Think about that. That might be even better than a CEA. Yeah, there's, there's been a, a couple studies out there and mainly <clears throat> kind of driven by the Cleveland Clinic. They're looking at glucose levels, intracystic glucose levels. And there's been some association that um, a certain level, to be honest, I don't remember off the top of my head the exact level, a certain level of glucose has been associated with it being, uh, correlating with it being a mucin producing or precancerous cyst and also uh, its risk of potentials uh, of malignancies there. And so therefore, those are the ones of cysts that you should you know, keep doing surveillance for. And if the glucose level is low, then those are the ones that you can argue for not doing surveillance for. But it's still you know, kind of in the early stages of, of research for that, but it is something that potentially is promising. So it's not something you're doing at Tampa General yet. It sounds uh, like it's dirt cheap also. Yeah, it's 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 cheap. Um, it is, it's not something we're universally doing. It is something that we've talked about incorporating. Well, we have not done that yet. Uh, there is also other things. There, there's the, uh, the, the pancreagen. It, it's basically looking at KRAS mutations within the pancreatic cyst. Um, that's sort of debatable as well uh, as, far, as far as how accurate that is and, and how much how you know how much validity you put into it and the initial studies when they started doing it were promising and and, and everyone had a lot of hype into it but then subsequent studies looking at it showed it didn't really correlate that well and didn't really work out as well as it thought so it's kind of fell out of favor um that was there's a lot of excitement about that uh, over the past you know kind of decade or so but um, so that, that was another thing people are looking at, but yeah, I mean, the, the intracystic glucose thing is an interesting thing and it's cheap and probably something we should probably start incorporating and doing. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Guerra. Sorry. I Dr. Guerra, go ahead. Thank you. I was just curious, like as a primary care doctor, you know, we come across these cysts, I feel like fairly often, either yeah. like an incidental finding, you know, on a CT, et cetera. Is there something that you would recommend that we do as a PCP when we get one of these before we, you know, immediately like refer them to GI? Is there something that we can order or something we can do to kind of expedite maybe um, um, you know, help the patient? So, uh, I mean, it, it, it also depends on the imaging that you found it on. Like if you found it on a like a non-contrast CT or like an, just an abdominal ultrasound, then uh, getting a good like MRI, MRCP is helpful, um, you know, and and, and, be in, and the way we order it, usually at Morsani, unfortunately, there's not a great order set for it, but if you have to order an MRI abdomen with contrast and then an MRCP also, you have to put in two orders. Um, and it's because like, if you just order an MRI abdomen with contrast, unfortunately, they don't always do the MRCP sequences. It's kind of frustrating. It's probably something we should honestly work with Epic on. But um, you know, getting a good MRI, if the patients can get an MRI, you know, I don't know if they have a you know pacemaker or defibrillator or some reason why they can't, or if they're claustrophobic. But and if they can't get an MRI, then getting a good CT with specifying for pancreas protocol. Um, those two things, if you got those done and, and then put the GI referral in, would be helpful to have it done before the office visit. Is there any reason to get um, like any tumor marker, like a CEA or any of those as part of it or just um, like the scan? So the, the serologic markers, I mean, you could get a CA-199 if you want to. Um, okay. A CEA level like is not going to be very helpful. 
Um, but I, I don't usually routinely get those. Um, so, so no, you, you don't have to get those tumor markers. Uh, it's not going to hurt the patient. It's just not necessarily going to be all that helpful. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay, it looks pretty quiet. It looks like the your, your GI gang uh, is uh, you know, holding back on the questions. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Gill had excellent point, but uh, excellent question, and the rest are like we're going to let Dr. Halal be. So, but hey, I can again, talk again. <laughs> I would say I agree strongly with Dr. Halal that do not order tumor markers on patients without tumors because we don't have any tumor markers that are 100% accurate. And if you get a CN99 that's mildly elevated. That could be for so many different reasons, and it just makes it very confusing. So I don't get tumor markers without tumors. All right. All right. Well, th uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for allowing me to, to present, and uh, it's really an honor, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan. Everybody great have a great day.